inquiry was to his capacity and uh, since I had known Belize for a very many years, he was an old Springwood identity as I was, uh, I felt a, a desire to uh, work under under this uh, man whom I regard as a you know, very big man in all respects. A big man physically and a big man in vision. <laughs> And uh, so I came in 1963 uh, with another, uh, Mr. Rowley Pearson, who took over the uh, manual arts department. And uh, uh, I stayed here as special master with Mr. Easton. I became deputy when the incumbent deputy, Mr. McCulloch, became a principal. And I continued on as deputy when Mr. McCulloch went to Katara in Newcastle and uh, Mr. Keith Wilson came to fill his position. And uh, from, uh, from St. Mary's High, I crossed the Great Western Highway and became principal of Colleton High School. Um, what were the students like when you were here? Well, when I came here, I came here after an experience of uh, Macquarie Boys High School. I can assure you at Macquarie Boys High School, an all boys school, and they were extremely difficult. <laughs> but uh, I tried to take some of the rough edges off them at, uh, at Macquarie. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, well trained. We used a lot of moral suasion at that school and my ability to persuade people to do things one way or another <laughs> had been heard. Uh, there was no proper punishment at Macquarie, by the, by the way. So I had an, an additional weapon when I came to St Mary's High School. The children themselves uh, were great kids. They were great kids. Uh, they demanded what was their right, in that you treated them with respect, and that you gave them what you were paid for, namely a teaching and attention in the classroom. They were top class children in that sense. Don't get the idea that they weren't tough, they were tough. Uh, some of the boys were tough, but uh, I didn't find them uh, particularly troublesome or worrisome after my experience at Macquarie Boys. In, in fact, in uh, later years, we become many of us uh, who were enemies at St Mary's High School became very good friends. They knew what the ground rules were, and I'm talking here of boys in relation to smoking and girls in the same area. They knew what the ground rules were. If you were apprehended smoking, for example, on the way to school at school, or on the way home from school, uh, in the case of boys, that you receive four straps of the cane. And with the young ladies, your parents were requested to come to the school. Now, know, knowing, knowing the ground rules, I was quite prepared to take it. And there's one young fellow who said to me, oh, Jack, <laughs> you win one style in nine times. And that was about the odds, he said. They didn't mind being caught. They may have hated your guts at the time, but uh, in retrospect, they didn't. Uh, so uh, they were uh, they were good kids. I, I liked them. I liked them. Secondly, uh, they came from a great cross section of the population. I mean, we talk of a multicultural population, multicultural nation in Australia today. But um, in those days, in, our, in the first in the first prefix body I, I took over, I've mentioned George Simskowski, for example, to you. Now, he was a Pole once, a Polish origin. Uh, he is now, I think I told you that he was now a uh, senior lecturer at the uh, University of New South Wales and uh, also in charge, chairman of the Law Reform Committee. The name of John Yannickus appears twice on the school on a board. Uh, one of the members of staff 
the wider cave as she was known here at uh, St Mary's I taught as wider bladder cave uh, there was a, a cosmopolitan uh, international uh, feeling and composition of students so that uh, if you walked into the school the first thing you noticed as George Finier quite a a famous artist who lived in Springwood at one time, now dead, uh, came down here once and he made the comment that St Mary's High School grieved, which it did, because of its openness, its gardens, its green grass. And he, as I did, he also noticed uh, three flags out the front around the Wishing Pearl, and they were the Australian flag, the school flag, and the flag of the United Nations indicating the international nature of this school. I can recall uh, trying to teach a group of 15 or so Chinese students English, an impossible task, but Bill opened his arms to uh, to those people who came from Hong Kong, for example. Uh, We had Japanese students uh, visiting the school. It, in all sense, was truly international international school and Bill had a lot of success with it so to answer your question overall the children were very good even even though I may have been regarded as an ogre uh, I did it I did it because uh, I thought they needed it and secondly because whether I liked it or not it was my role I mean I'm a different person as, as a classroom teacher to the person that I am as a deputy principal or a special master uh, you, have to, you have to change your clothing or your hat depending upon uh, your position as a principal you can be most magnanimous but as a deputy you have to be unapproachable and so, and so you see uh, students will get a very different idea to the person that I really am I'm really very soft hearted <laughs> Thank you. Can you tell us about the teachers at Wyoming? Yes, I suppose I can tell you about the teachers. I can, I can recall coming here with uh, with uh, a young man in his first appointment, Glenn Sargent. Now, Glenn, uh, I think Glenn spent a terrible long time here. Uh, he became a science master eventually here. Uh, he, I think he could have become deputy here, but he went uh, out, of, uh, out of the school to do so. Uh, I think we can put him to, uh, uh, as a credit to Glenn, uh, the role that uh, Rugby Union, sorry, Rugby League, played in the school. He's a mad, keen footballer. And when I went to Colton, of course, I was always mad keen to beat my old, my old still, which we did once, hundred once. Uh, I remember John Bloomfield. Uh, John Bloomfield wasn't a teacher, but he was, he was, uh, had a, I think, I think he was uh, in a class that was taught by a young lady who has eventually become the model of the year. A bit of a doll she was. Uh, and uh, John, John, of course, was to uh, become quite a well-known artist. I see one of his, his works in that book and uh, I think he exhibited the Archibald Prize uh, gallery. Uh, he was a student here. He was a student here, yes. Uh, Alan Huggins, of course, was a, a pupil who became a teacher, and he's the uh, I'm getting around. I'm, I'm getting around your question a little. Oh, that's fine. Uh, he started off in Browning Block, which was the block which was given over to uh, people of uh, specific difficulties and uh, who had learning difficulties. And uh, you might also notice the name Scott Browning. Uh, Browning uh, 
Browning was the name given to that block by Mr. Eason because it was after the power from it he obtained all his inspiration. Whenever he was in trouble, uh, you know, he wanted some uh, strength, he would read Browning. Lawson also was a great favourite of his, but then back to Alan Huggins. Alan Huggins eventually rose out of, uh, our rose out of Browning block, became, did a degree at uh, university, became a teacher. And uh, educationally and, uh, and as far as knowledge is concerned, he has left me far behind. So it's another feature of the school, isn't it, that uh, when, you, when you found yourself in Browning block, you weren't in a, a black pit from which you would never escape. There was always an avenue of escape. And Browning Block was very close to Mr. Easton's heart and the pupils therein was uh, additionally. Um, Mr. Lambert and uh, the uh, band, I know that you're going to see Mr. Lambert, but he was one of the most meticulous people I ever met. He was an assistant on the English staff when I was here. He taught up in the far end of Chaucer Block. I saw his car, the boot of his car, and he had everything in place. <laughs> and I can remember reading a routine order, you know, when the cadets were going away to camp. Uh, and it went something like this. I may exaggerate, but to indicate the meticulous nature of the man, at 0800 oh, hours, uh, the unit will assemble in single file on St Mary's railway station, three yards back from the platform. At 801, uh, the drum mark will pick up the drum and advance one pace. At 802, the train will arrive. At 803, we we'll all pick up our material and, and so on. The routine orders for the day were down to the down to the second. But nevertheless, obviously a top class teacher. How were the students disciplined? Well, I, th I think that I, I have answered that question to a degree yeah, under a previous question. But I may have given the wrong impression in so far as uh, that one always seemed to get, uh, you know, get the corporal punishment for any misdemeanor. That's furthest from the truth. As I say, there were major school rules that if broken made, they were laid down so that uh, pupils knew what the penalty was. Um, but there was a, a, a lot of, of counselling. That was a part of my job. Uh, and we had a school counsellor and we had also one of the best uh, welfare officers, I suppose in the old days we called him a truant officer, but a welfare officer, in the person of uh, uh, Mr. Graham Morris, whom the, whom the children feared but whom they loved, particularly those who, you know, escaped school or hid behind the counter down at the shopping centre. <laughs> we used to go out on, pra on patrol to see looking for these children and the word used to get round that we were out and they'd, the shopkeepers would hide them behind the canvas and all stuff. But Ray Morris was uh, a good looking man. He would have been about uh, in his early thirties. Um, very persuasive, very handy with his fists. Uh, he was a black dog in judo. Uh, he was a member of the Junior Davis Cup squad and as fit as a Mallee Bull he was. And if you got somebody opposite as you are sitting there then, who was particularly belligerent, he would lean over and say, Well, son, you can take the first punch, but you be sure of it. <laughs> because you won't get a second chance. And we could have. But he was. He, he was a, a wonderful. He was a wonderful uh, friend to the girl or boy who was in trouble, in real trouble, 
but he was also pretty harsh on those people who just did not toe the line because they didn't want to toe the line. Now there is a difference, isn't there, between the person who is in difficulty and he helped as far as he possibly could and those who, who just flouted rules and regulations. So there was a terrible lot of, uh, terrible lot of counselling done. Um, and of course uh, parental contact but in those days, uh, mum and dad were working and it was very difficult. I suppose it was much the same as it is today. We used to call them latchkey children in those days. Where most children uh, had a key to get in when uh, they got home from school. And uh, mum and dad uh, couldn't get up to the uh, school as often as they wished. So that, yes, uh, corporal punishment was there. Yes, I did carry it in the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, I did have a, uh, as appearance of a, a hunchback of Notre Dame appearance. Uh, but, well, you never know what you might leave in your head. Many people have remembered your cane. Does that answer your question? Yeah. What were the buildings like? <coughs> Well, the buildings were, uh, compared with the buildings you have now, they would be uh, regarded as slumber like. Uh, only, only because, only because they were built to put the pit in, in their surrounds, uh, they, they fitted magnificently into the surrounds. So I, I'm only looking, I'm only, my first comment is only in relation to the substance with which they were built and the facilities for which, uh, of which staff had and which pupils had in relation to, say, science rooms and art rooms and staff common rooms and uh, staff lunch rooms and the like. They compared in, they compared uh, very poorly with what the school possesses today, but nevertheless, I would say that my seven years here were very, very happy years, and if you are happy in a school, uh, no matter what the buildings are like, well, uh, uh, they must have been satisfactory. You know, they, they were made of timber, they were on brick piers, as the photo shows. Uh, most of them had a veranda, some of them didn't. Uh, the two science rooms of Newton and Einstein didn't, they opened into closed verandas and they had doors at either end. Uh, Mr. Reeson's original office was in uh, the English staff room at Chaucerbock, for example. Um, the original, uh, original toilets, for example, were, were uh, a pan system job. So we had no, uh, no uh, sewerage school in its early days. Uh, by the time I got here, the answer was yes, we did by 1963. Uh, but you just go around the building, go around Chaucer from time being, and uh, around, uh, what was geography? Let's forget it's done. Da Vinci. Da Vinci, Da Vinci is right. In Keats and Victoria and Blake and Lloyd Wright and uh, I don't think our Dean room had a no. But they were all built of timber and they were all in piers for the most part. But the gardens about them were magnificent. They kept one by a gentleman the late Mr Jack Pullen. He uh, he started the gardens here. And uh, he worked very, very hard. And later, uh, Mr. Don Vickery uh, had no reason to go to work, but uh, he was a retired dairy farmer from Ludman, but and uh, out of respect for the reason and desire just to keep his hands in, he came and continued on the work of uh, Mr. Pullen. The, uh, the uh, grounds, the grounds were just beginning. Uh, the running track was uh, was there at the time, but uh, uh, you 
you see the ground uh, over on the railway side was originally uh, for a technical college and the school did not have uh, access to that ground originally so you are very lucky that a tech college was at uh, Mount River, don't you? You have more grounds. So, uh, no, they weren't on that. They were very functional. And I say functional because uh, when we moved at the end of a period, the children moved out into the open air and the air and any noise they made dissipated. So you could sit in, uh, in the office in... Uh, uh, what, uh, Lawson Block, was it? I remember. Lawson Block, and then he could have a change of period, and you wouldn't know that the period had changed. In fact, an inspector was in the school one day, and he said, I must go uh, and see so and so at the end of this period, and uh, Bill Winston said, Well, the period's just in, and he said, There's all the noise. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was absolutely no noise at all. And they were actually walking past the window. So they were extremely functional, extremely functional buildings. But they tended, they tended uh, as the years went by to get uh, rot and dry rot. And, uh, some of the science buildings had to be, be rebuilt and so on. But uh, no, quite functional. And, uh, the, the children uh, were not at a disadvantage for it. But uh, time demanded that they be replaced and even in my day uh, work had commenced on the home science block before I left it was, it was beginning so uh, it's now reaching for isn't it, the change yeah. What special memories do you have of the school? Uh, I have terrific memories of the school I remember the uh, the variation in people's ideas of, uh, of assemblies uh, we had formal assemblies and informal assemblies. Uh, the informal assemblies were held around the steps of the Vinci block. I mean, if something urgent was to be taken place, it didn't go over the ample, I didn't go over the PA system. It, uh, it, we had a quick assembly, a quick assembly. And there was no getting sitting up in lines or standing to attention. You just milled around like uh, eight or nine hundred uh, sheep, and you couldn't ever differentiate between uh, uh, year seven or year ten, or a first former or a sixth, fifth former in those days. And uh, the announcements were given from uh, from the steps of the Vinci block. Once a week, however, we had a formal assembly on the front lawn, and the girls were always instructed to carry a piece of plastic in the six faces in case the glass was wet. So, uh, you always uh, took out a piece of plastic and sat down. We just sat down on the grass. I remember, I remember, I remember the days uh, of the uh, 150th anniversary of the crossing of the Blue Mountains, as I mentioned, Mr. Easton was uh, very much involved in that. And uh, amongst other things, he, uh, he had a member of the, the cadet unit raise the flag during that crossing, or during that year possibly. I mean, my memory's not quite good enough. Maybe it was during the days amidst the journey talk, or maybe it was during the year out at the crossing of South Creek out near Memory House which was the house of the law supply from Memory and somebody would uh, rally out there each morning and raise the flag uh, there was a there was a, a play written which was performed in the, in the I think the Memorial Hall was built in those days uh, performed in the Memorial Hall and uh, and there was a tune written by the band club of St Mary's to commemorate that particular occasion. So uh, those things, those things are, in, uh, you know, still in my mind. Of course, it was uh, Bill's idea that this uh, this area he claimed to be the birthplace of a nation, and that was his catch cry: the birthplace of a nation, South Creek, the birthplace of a nation, because we were. You know, where we were held in by the mountains, and it was 
the crossing of the mountains of the you know, unfold of the plains that uh, Clancy talks about. So I remember that, and I remember uh, him getting an architect to build a, a very large tower, not uh, not Babylonian inside, but quite large, uh, that was to be erected uh, just uh, in the vicinity of where the uh, Bennett Wagon is down there. And he wanted all of South Creek to be developed as a park, the South Creek Park, he called it, and I think he would be very pleased to see what developments have taken place there already because I have noticed that uh, a lot of that area has been developed. As I have mentioned, that uh, another memory, it's a distasteful memory, but it's a part of school history, was that uh, St Mary's High School was the first school to appear in the headlines of uh, the papers as a school and its drugs were involved. Uh, and quite unfairly so because uh, while the person concerned was in, the pupil concerned was involved with drugs, it was an involvement that was out of school and an involvement which had taken place some six months earlier. But nevertheless, the Daily Mirror got onto it. I'm sure it was the Daily Mirror. There's a photo of the Daily Mirror if you ever are able to get hold of it. And there's a chap walking across the front of uh, the admin block, the old admin block. That's the thing. That is I. I'm in the mirror. Yeah, that's so big. I can't be recognised, but that is I. But it has. It has blazing on the front page. And didn't we get the didn't we get the big hurrah when we returned to Springwood that afternoon? Mm -hmm. and this was thrust in our thrust in our face. I was all, I also had to laugh about the occasion when uh, Billyson was called out of a principal's conference. I don't know whether he could tell us this story, does he? Uh, you see, there, as I told you, there was no sewage system uh, in the school when uh, he built the pool. But I came, I came out here to have a look at the school and I went over to have a look at it and there were two of the manual arts stuff over there. They're scoffed on beds, they built the pool and they were taking the money for <laughs> people to go in there. And they had they had a sewerage system on there and apparently they they tapped the line, the Commonwealth Government line that serviced uh, the industrial area without permission. <laughs> And Bill was at a Bill was at a principal's conference on that particular day, and he had a phone call that uh, from the Penrith Council that a pipe had burst. That they were starting to grade the road in front of the entrance to the pool. Apparently, they hadn't put the sewage pipe down deep enough, and the grader uprooted the pipe. It was the first account they were knew that he had actually uh, tapped into the line. That's a, that's, a, that's a memory of the, of the school, and of course there would be, be uh, many others. Oh, there an, another one that I do remember. I can recall the, the lady from St Mary's who was the uh, first St Mary's lad that was killed in Vietnam. Uh, Bill McCulloch and I went to his funeral at uh, the Anglican Church. And a request, uh, a request was made that uh, the cortege passed the, the high school. And uh, Bill McCulloch and I, uh, just during the school holidays, one of the school holidays from memory, and uh, Bill McCulloch and I came down here, raised the flags, and laid them to half past for the cortege. The place it was a, a really sad affair, a very sad affair. So, yes, that sticks in my mind. Uh, that's enough of memories, isn't it? Can you tell me about some of the traditions of the school? Well, I, I feel as though I might have obliquely mentioned those in passing. I've mentioned, uh, for example, uh, the international nature of the, of the school. Um, I, I could mention that uh, Every one of those, every one of those main plates that were in a, in a particular building had a quote or a verse. And uh, in Lawson Block there was a quotation about nature. 
and that also was a great tradition of the school. Um, we uh, we learn to accept, uh, and our pupils learn to accept the people who came from uh, another another country, because uh, very many of them uh, were amongst the first of the displaced people to arrive in Australia. We did get we did get some of the earliest ones at Penrith, via via Katie, for example, one of the displaced persons. She was the Sovereign's mistress here until her death. Uh, she was a displaced person. Where was she from? I, I, I've got an I've got an idea. She uh, she came from a, a Scandinavian country. But that, that I'm not sure. Um, but I, I think that I, I've answered the, most of your questions. In, 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 in mm. Mm. What part did sport play in school? Oh, a, a very large part. Um, in the early days of the school, I don't think we could have, I don't think Belisson would have claimed that, uh, you know, we had the intellectual ability of the students of Fort Street. So there was a certain sublimation, I would think, a super, super perfection in another area. Uh, let, let me add, let me add. But as the years went by and we grew in a number of status, our academic attainments were just as good as uh, in the other school. For example, the first, the, the first fifth year that I can recall, it was not the first fifth year that went through the school, I don't think it was the first fifth year, but the fifth year that I can first remember going through the school did particularly well. Um, so, as a school grows, of course, its academic uh, performance is enhanced. Uh, however, uh, I would say that there was uh, a lot of emphasis placed on sport. We had some top class runners. Uh, Boris Stabina. He, he played a little while with the Panthers in his early days. And Alan Hopkins. Now, in successive years, those two lads. Uh, won three, three medals apiece at the combined high school athletics meet in Sydney and that's, a, that's not a bad effort you know and it was 120 and broad jump in each, each case uh, amongst the girls, I don't mention the girls very often but here too we had uh, top class runners uh, one of the uh, one of them was a girl, his nickname was Shorty, Shorty Turner. Mm -hmm. huh? Remember Shorty? Mm -hmm. Her father was the linesman also at, uh, in, the, in the rugby league. She had a lot of, a lot of potential. She was a top class athlete and uh, I think she pulled an Achilles tendon and uh, attacked him at the end of uh, her career. And then the two, uh, the younger of the two Cassidy girls, uh, Ronnie Cassidy, top class athlete. And you know, you can go down and uh, down the list and uh, you can. Uh, soccer, no, we weren't particularly good at soccer because the emphasis was on, uh, on rugby, rugby league. Uh, girls uh, more than held their own in, uh, you know, netball and those things. But, of, of course, uh, they didn't take the limelight in those days, did they? I mean, I, I'm not talking about girls, but that type of sport, once you got away, say, from cricket, and I can't remember any great cricketers at the school in those times, once you got away from cricket and rugby league and athletics, uh, the others didn't get a great amount of, uh, shall I say, con, but uh, they, were, they were very, very important in the school. And I am not uh, denigrating them because uh, I can't remember any outstanding personalities. Do you remember the cadets? I do, yes, yes. Can <laughs> you tell us about them? Uh, top class cadet unit, top class cadet unit. Uh, uh, top class band, by the way, I mean, top class 
top class leader in the person of John Lambert, uh, whom I hear on Andrew Wiley's show every now and again. He was he was the officer commanding of the cadet unit, and when he left the school, uh, and Mr. Alf Smith took over. But they were uh, they were top class, and uh, their band was not only a, a drum band; it was also uh, an instrument band, uh, the tuba and the cornet and uh, the uh, bugle. In fact, one of the best bugle players I ever heard in my life was a person, a lad by the name of Lyons. Uh, he he was he was uh, always invited, as was the as was the cadet unit, always invited to the Springwood uh, RSL Day Anzac Day March. And uh, the young fellow lines, he would uh, play the last post and the rebellion last post, and uh, he was top class. Now they received a lot of help from uh, St Mary's Band Club. Uh, a lot of help because that, that, that was strong, and I believe it is still as strong as ever. Uh, the only complaint I heard about them was from my member of staff. When one of the drummers put uh, his residue, they used to practice down by, beyond the Toynbee block, and Mr. Step used to park his car incorrectly because he, he was told not to park it down there. But he did, same thing, right? And they uh, put their drum on, uh, on the, the bit of his car, and you know those little nuts that mm -hmm. the and squares tighten up the skin when uh, they happen to scratch his boot, and he wanted. He wanted compensation. I said, what car? There's no parking down there. There's no car down there. So said, what car? Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, I had to bluff him out of it. But, uh, uh, where was I going? Uh, I used to go away regularly on camps and uh, they, uh, they paraded and uh, they met here regularly each or once a week. And, uh, oh no, they were top class unit. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that we noticed, particularly the executive, and I don't know whether the staff noticed this, but we noticed that anybody who got into a, uh, a school football team or a school volleyball team or a school netball team or a school, what's that, rounders game, uh, softball <laughs> team or the school band or the school cadets, they always seem to be better children because of it. And uh, this is one of the features of the, uh, of the uh, cadets. That children who could do nothing else, they could keep in step. Mm. <laughs> and they became very, very good members of the school cadet unit. And the resultant discipline, because there is a lot of discipline, once you get into camp, a lot of discipline, uh, it seemed to transfer itself to the classroom and they became better children because of it. It, it, uh, it was uh, a wonderful adjunct to the school. Yeah. Do you remember anything else about school band? The school band? I, I can tell you, uh, but it, we got into trouble, uh, that is Steve Wilson and I, when uh, Val Lambert and Barry uh, Fitzgerald, I think his name was, deputy, took over the school from us. The, the band had deteriorated, not so much deteriorated, to become defunct uh, to uh, a large degree, particularly in, in, in the area of the instruments. And the instruments were uh, stored in a storeroom in Browning Block High, up on the shelves. And the TV people and the sports people were looking for uh, also a place to store their equipment, including uh, shot putts and javelins and the like. And somebody got into that room one day, and they used the javelins to, uh, uh, and they used the javelins to hurl. And where do you think they hurled them? They hurled them through the instruments. 
inside the chambers and I missed the thing. The chambers and the cornets. And, uh, and we were taking Bell around to school. We didn't know about it, you see. Yeah, we took him past there and he didn't see it, but uh, being over at college, and I used to go over to come over here and see him from time to time. He came over there from time to time. Oh, and didn't he, didn't he test or something one day for allowing all of these, all of these instruments to be so destroyed? Uh, it wasn't knowing me done. And we were very, very sorry because of it. But, uh, no, I don't think there's, uh, anything else about the way in there. I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us? What, what about the origin of the school? What about the naming of Mount Druid? About, uh, you see, one of the, one, one of the it's, it's rather interesting this, that uh, Bill, the Bill Eason was uh, most international in his approach. Now I mentioned Bill because, because uh, I, think, I, think, I think that he laid that he laid the foundations, you know, for the whole philosophy of the school. And, uh, and it's a rather coincidence that uh, of all the countries in the world of which he was afraid, that troubled him, was Indonesia. Mm. And uh, I can recall him, see, I, I met Bill as a deputy at Penrith High School. Uh, he came here as uh, teacher in charge of the St Mary's Annex. So that's another story. I'll tell you that one in a moment. Um, and he used to drive me home. We, we, uh, we travelled home in his early model, Holden, FJ. <laughs> and I saw him almost in tears one day, fearful of the invasion of Australia by Indonesia. No other, no other country seemed to have the same effect upon them, on, upon him. Uh, he was, he was very worried about them. Um, I've told you about Graham Morris. Now, the naming of Mount Druid, uh, I, I recall when Mount Druid was named, the, uh, the suburbs of Mount Druid. Uh, it was during the days of Bill Eason, and uh, Bill McCulloch was the deputy at the time. He was a member of the local historical society. And he showed me a map. Uh, and he said, well, this is what Mount Druid is going to be. And I knew Mount Druid is a few little scrubby trees and a lot of clay and uh, two shops and uh, a small post office. And a run-down cricket over. I used to play cricket there. And he said, this is what it's going to be, Jack. And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm uh, giving the names to the suburbs of what will be a new Mount Druid. Mm. And he said, there'll be five high schools here last day. Mm. <laughs> Where are the children coming from? <laughs> I mean, they're coming out of Warrens. And he said, no, no. And I can remember him uh, particularly naming Dunevitt, because Dunevitt was a, a property on which my late father-in-law worked, and I'd heard of Dunevitt before. And, uh, I remember him naming a particular area, Dunevitt. But he did, he did. He named all of those. Uh, he didn't name the streets, obviously. No. But the suburbs. So, uh, uh, while Mount Druitt uh, has moved up the hill a bit from the old Mount Druitt, uh, each of those places like Emmett and uh, Wayne and, and uh, uh, what, uh, Shelby, Shelby <laughs> Step Ridge Park, and, uh, they all have those names, all have some significance to families or people mm. who lived in this area. And those names were, were put on that map in the Mr. McCulloch, who was typically still as I mentioned, on the map. Uh, uh, while he was at this school. Mm. Um, now the origins of the school interest me. I, I, I told uh, Lindell a little bit about it. That 
this girl originally was an annex of Penrith High School at which I was teaching and at which uh, Mr. Easton was deputy principal. And that's why he didn't like a hooter. He refused to have the hooter stand there. Mm. Because outside his office, his deputy principal's office at Penrith, was the hooter. <laughs> and every time it went up, he raised from the chair and so he had a great aversion for the hooter. And so he was sent out here to uh, look after this annex. Uh, I, by that time, I, as I said, I lived here, and this was just a big open paddock. I used to pick up some manure here for my garden. But by this time, uh, I returned to Springwood to live. And I still came down to Penrith High School, while Bill came to St Mary's. And of the two blocks first built were uh, Chaucer and Twenty. But St Mary's High School had at its first classrooms some buildings out on the industrial area. Because Blacktown Boys High School, uh, which was in the process of building, was not yet complete. And so Blacktown Boys High School took over the residence in uh, St Mary's High School premises. And that upset Bill no end. Mm -hmm. Particularly when the, the principal of Blacktown Boys High School was <coughs> made the comment that his boys' toilets were far better than the headmaster's office. Oh no! <laughs> uh, Bill wasn't wasn't at all impressed by that. That's about the, the story. My story. I'm meek and mild If you insist on saying That I'm just a problem child You're gonna get all my attention And your wish will be my rule And maybe you'll be good to me Just keep me after school An apple for the teacher That's how I better start then after a while, you may give in and let me bring my heart. An apple for the teacher to show I'm meek and mild. If you insist on saying that I'm just a problem child, you'll get all my attention. Your wish will be my rule. And maybe you'll be good to me and keep me after school. And apple for the teacher, that's how I'd better start. 
then after a while you may give in and let me bring my heart. An apple for the teacher is always going to do the trick. Not if you didn't study your arithmetic. I got an apple for the teacher. It's going to meet with great success. Well, it won't if you didn't memorize the Gettysburg Address. I got a little bit of glamour and a charm that's cute and quaint. I'm next to your grandma and believe you were what you ain't. I got an apple, big red apple for the teacher. That's how I'm fixing to start. Then after a while, I may give in and let you bring your heart. Then after a while, she may give in and let you bring your heart. 